And welcome to episode 150 of the PowerScore LSAT podcast. I'm Dave Galoran in Napa Valley. And this is John Dinning in Los Angeles. John, it's been a few days and the LSAT <laughs> happened in between those days. How yeah. are you? And it feels like a few months. Anytime we get an LSAT sandwich like this, it just, time creeps. It's funny, time flies and time creeps. Well, I was on vacation and then rolled right into this test, so it kind of felt like getting punched in the face at the end of a good time. Not really what you want. That's a tough thing to come home to. Well, obviously, after an experience like this past weekend, I'm sure you're drinking something. What would that be? Yeah, in fact, uh, we're recording this kind of late in the evening on a Monday. But yesterday, I took a little break from all the LSAT stuff for a couple hours and went to just a, a house party down like by Venice Beach. And one of the guys there was drinking really nice scotch, this Dalmore 15-year scotch. Uh, I won't talk about what it costs, but he was drinking it. And at the end, he knew how much I liked it, and he just gave me a bottle to take home. Well, that was generous. You have uh, pretty nice friends from the sound of it. I, yeah, I just met him there, too. I, it's not a person I knew until yesterday, and now I'm pretty sure we're going to be best friends forever. But I'm drinking the scotch that he gave me, so it's a nice 15-year uh, Dalmore. Outstanding. Yeah. I wish I could say I had some kind of cool story, but... Since I was on vacation and oddly enough didn't drink this was uh, because I was at Disney World and that's not really the easiest place to do that at sometimes. Come back to an old staple and that would be a classic white Russian. Uh, although a friend suggested a drink called the Eclipse and I was like, well, that actually sounds appropriate because obviously we had the Eclipse this past week. Uh, but then he mentioned there was a bunch of gin in it. So I had to say that's not going to happen for me. Yeah. Gin's a tricky one. I am. Um... Gin's my kryptonite. You know this. If I drink too much gin, I, I head to another planet. So I try to steer away on the podcast, at least for for the sake of the listeners. It's funny because I always just thought is if you drink too much of anything, that's what happens. So I didn't realize it was especially true with gin. Yeah, but gin's like my bullet train. Like it gets me there quicker than anything. <laughs> so I have to be careful. I could do scotch for days, but gin's trouble. For some people, it's tequila. For you, it's gin. Yeah. I I don't know. Rum and vodka don't bother me at all. So I've, I have yet to find what my Achilles heel is and I don't want to. There we go. We're in a comfort zone here. Um, let's talk a little bit about music. And this is no great insight or anything. A lot of times we pick songs based on either current events or something that happened maybe with the test or with the LSAT, uh, LSAC folks. This time I just happened to watch Saturday Night Live uh, this past Saturday with Gosling hosting and Chris Stapleton as the musical guest. And he played, uh, the first song he played is a song called White Horse. And it's just a song I like. So that's what we're going with today. Well, you like Chris Stapleton and I like Ryan Gosling, so we're good there. Yeah, I like them both, as it turns out. And it was a pretty great episode. If you get a chance, watch the Beavis and Butthead sketch that they did. It's uh, It had me in stitches. I've seen it, and I think right now Ryan Gosling is having his America Loves Me moment, so congrats to him. He's, he's kinning all the way. <laughs> so Let's there we are. <laughs> on that <laughs> note, let's rip through uh, the LSAT world information super quick, because I don't think we really need to cover this all that much. We just had the April 2024 LSAT. Um, we still have makeup tests that are coming in uh, about a week or so. Scores from that, all these tests will come out on May 1st. We'll come back to that particular point. The next test that you can register for right now, really the moment the only test you can register for is the june 2024 lsat that is on the 6th 7th and 8th of june that registration will close in just about a week from now on tuesday april 23rd that is i think as almost everybody knows at this point if they've uh, been around the block with the lsat the very last test with logic games after that we move into a new cycle that starts in august They've released the kind of the dates on that, August, September, October, November, and so forth, but you can't register for those tests. But I have it on very good authority that we'll see those registration dates um, and the ability to register for those tests released around mid-May. Yeah, so, so if you want to take August, you're going to have to wait another month or so, and then you'll be able to register, and that goes for September, October, et cetera for all those test dates. So that covers the upcoming LSATs and the registration possibilities. Yeah, let me make one final point on that though, uh, before we close it out completely, which is that LSAC has made a special exemption or exception for April test takers who want to potentially take the test in June, because you've got a, a strange kind of lack of overlap here where you don't get your April scores back until Wednesday, May 1st. 
but June registration closes on April the 23rd, which is a week from when this should release, a week from when you're probably listening to it. So there's about eight days of a gap there where you'd have to have registered eight days before you'll know your April results. LSAC, to their credit, I think this was a great move, has uh, allowed people who took the April test and are waiting for their scores and who register for June as a safety net, they're letting you withdraw from June for a full refund after the April scores come out. So if you're on the fence about June, if you're like, I don't know if I should register or not, it depends on how April went, register for it. And if April goes your way, you can pull back and get your money. If April didn't go your way, then you've actually made the deadline for June and you're safe. Yeah. And special thanks to one of our contacts at LSAC for highlighting that to us, because I think it's very, very worthwhile to bring that information forward. Uh, and last time, I think we gave them a little bit of a hard time and they let us know. They're like, wait, there actually is an exception to this. Uh, and we wanted to pass that along. Now, if you are taking that June LSAT or if you're taking August or later, there's a couple webinars that we're always uh, running that we're doing that we want to kind of convey to you. The first one is on the day this comes out, uh, we have a webinar on reading comprehension skills tests. One of our favorite webinars built off a podcast and blog that we've done as well. Very good, super helpful for RC. And of course, RC is not going anywhere. So that's the kind of thing that if you're taking one of these LSATs at any point this year, you'd be good to brush up on. Then we've got the 24th of April, we're doing a basic conditional webinar. That'll be followed on May 14th by the advanced conditional webinar. So they kind of work together, talk about conditionality, certainly within the logical reasoning sphere, a little bit in the logic game sphere. And then John, specifically for you and I, uh, it looks like we're going to do what we call a mini ball, a little crystal mini ball, a crystal ball revisited, where we're going to go back in to the predictions that we made from April and June, revisit those and update them. So it's a miniaturized version of the crystal ball. It'll be focused solely on the June LSAT. We also will not do the portions where we go through and talk about the percentages of questions that typically show up, you know, what type of games you should study, all that kind of stuff. We'll just go into the predictions and update the recommended problem set. So it ends up being uh, considerably shorter than the regular crystal ball, which still does apply to June. This will now then refine the predictive portion of that. That is on May 1st. You can sign up for that. The easiest link to get to it is go to powerscore.com forward slash free seminars. That'll take you into the new resource center. Uh, we've had a new website that has just launched and that is part of it. Uh, and so right now that's a redirect that will take you there, but you can register for the crystal mini ball on May 1st. John and I will be there as usual, uh, drinking water. That's right. <laughs> Maybe something a little more caffeinated, but not stronger. Uh, I'll make one last comment about the mini ball. Again, just to close this off, which is, you know, you and I weren't certain really until this April test had uh, progressed and then finished if we were even going to do this. So the fact that we're now committed to it, this is a bit of foreshadowing for later in this discussion, uh, gives you some idea that April has changed the way that we see June a little bit. And that's largely due to the fact that April went the way we hoped. Exactly. Yeah. We if it didn't go the way we hoped, then we would transfer those predictions to June. Right. If it does go the way we hoped and it knocks out some of the things that we have suggested are going to be there, then we have to change it. We have enough time to do that between April and June. So we are going to do that. But before we get there, <laughs> let's talk about some of the background let's talk about uh, April. Po points of interest for that April 2024 LSAT. Let's first start off with the test statistics and the breakdown. Uh, and in talking to... Uh, our friends at LSAC, they gave us a pretty good overview of the number of test takers per day. And I will say that the prediction that they gave us was, hey, I think it's going to be about 17,500. And that's built upon, they, there's always attrition. So they can't, they can say how many registrations there are, but they don't know exactly how many people are going to take it. And full credit due here, the final number was about 17,570 test takers. Yeah pretty close to it <laughs> um and when you look at totals like that really interesting because last april there were only about 13 and a half thousand so you're up around 17 percent year to year there are a lot of people taking the lsat and of course one of the theories on that uh sure you could say people are just really excited about law school and the legal academy in general but <laughs> this is probably seeing some swelling numbers as logic games lovers 
get their tests in before the the execution of logic games that looms on the horizon for us all. But there's really kind of an interesting thing, John, is it almost looked to me based upon the internal numbers that Thursday was probably just by a slight bit, maybe the largest of the three test days around 6,200. Then on Friday, it looked like it was a little bit smaller around 5,800 to 6,000. And then on Saturday, that was the smallest of the three test days at 5,400. That ends up getting you to around 17,500 on the prediction. So I always think of the Saturday test is almost by default the biggest. Right. That wasn't the case here. So it was a lot. Yeah. And I've, I've got theories on why that might be. Uh, I can tell you, I wouldn't want to be a first day test taker just in case there's some kinks in the system that need to get worked out or something goes wrong. But at the same time, it would be awfully nice after your LSAT to have a whole weekend to celebrate. So there is some appeal to Thursday just because it clears Friday to Sunday to go. Absolutely pedal to the metal. You didn't think Friday was enough time to celebrate. You had to go all the way back to Thursday. <laughs> you don't know how to celebrate. Actually, you, you do. I do know how you celebrate. <laughs> you do know. So yeah, I'd have taken I, it on Tuesday if they let me. Uh, I'm a little more tempered on that. I would be uh, <laughs> more like a Friday person. Sure enough. All right. With that said, usually I read a long list of disclaimers at this point before we start talking about uh, each individual LSAT. Um, I'm not going to do all that. I am going to read one of the disclaimers, and it's to me the most important one. If you want to hear the disclaimers, go back to our last test recap episode from February, where I talk about all sorts of things about what it means about test difficulty, how we get this information, how the test makers are trying to confuse you. Instead, what I'm going to say is something I say every time. All that we ask when you are relaying information about the what's real and what's not, what uh, our scoring scale predictions are is please don't summarize it online in a couple of words. Uh, the summaries often miss the nuance of what we talk about. And since it's a free podcast, we would just ask that you send people directly to the podcast instead of saying, oh, this form is, you know, minus seven or minus eight, because usually we're adding things in. And that is it. Huh. So we just saved myself about two minutes and everyone else uh, two minutes. That's John? usually where I take a drink break. So thanks for that. Yeah, nothing. well, sorry. Now I'm going to let you talk for a while while I drink. It's fair enough. That seems appropriate. All right. So we're going to do something a little bit differently with this one and how we're going to move through the content. If anyone listening to this has listened to past test recaps where there has been both a domestic version of the test as well as internationals, we usually split those up. Typically, we cover the international content first and essentially treat it as separate from the domestic stuff, largely because there's not any overlap in most, if not almost all instances. However, this time there was overlap and quite a bit of it, in fact. So several sections that we saw used domestically were also used internationally. So we're going to do kind of a lumping thing. We're going to combine all of this. So when we talk about logic games, we're going to talk about all of the scored sections of logic games, domestic and international. And we'll note what appeared where, or both. But know that as we go through this, this is going to apply to you no matter where on the globe you happen to be or happen to have taken this test. So again, a slightly different um, approach to it this time. What we are going to do that is traditional, though, is start with a self-assessment of our crystal ball predictions. Let's, Dave, grade ourselves on just how we did. And this I will split up. So I'll do international and then domestic separately. Chime in whenever you feel like it. Let's talk about the international test broadly in terms of what we saw happening there. So in terms of the crystal ball, the way that we tend to go about making predictions of test reuse is we look back at tests that are old enough that they could be fresh again. They're not so recent that people could still remember them and that haven't been reused already. So content that's appeared once on a slightly older test that seems ripe for a secondary usage those are the sections tests that we tend to pull from. The international tests, as this, as far as we could tell this time, primarily contain material that was on its second or third or more reuse. So this wouldn't have been the first time we've seen it again. This would have been the second or third or sometimes fourth or more time that we've seen it. So that's not content that we ever even attempt to include in our predictions. Again, we only predict first time reuses. We'll get to do that for the domestic tests, but internationally, unfortunately, if you took one of those tests, you wouldn't have seen anything that was predicted by the crystal balls, at least in terms of topic or test. Which is by design. We're not trying to predict those tests. That's not what we had ever attempted to do 
Um, it's kind of nice when we get lucky, and this has happened a few times when our predictions for reuse applies to international as well. But in this case, they used things for multiple reuses again, so it didn't really work. Yeah, and sometimes people ask us about that. You know, here you had a test administration that was over 17,000 people, but really a fraction of those were international, maybe a thousand. And so we, when you have small tests like that, they have so many more options. They can use tests more frequently because they have a source that they've essentially isolated. They know where they're coming from. And so that opens up the library of test reuses for them. That immediately means that for our purposes, it's we're not trying to play like throw darts. We're trying to say, usually we have a fairly good understanding. And I think the track record now is what 23 of the last 26 tests that you know we've looked at we've predicted something on them we don't include the international test on that we also don't do that for the retaker test i've already been asked about that multiple times and i'm like look there's so many options they could use just about anything that's a fool's errand to try to predict it but when you've got a domestic test that's like 16,000, that's so many people they don't have as many options and that when those options are narrowed, that's when we can come in and look at patterns, look at reuses, track all that and say, hmm, it's probably in this zone. And that's how a little bit of the way the crystal ball works from a predictive standpoint. Yeah. And that's actually a perfect transitional note to move into the domestic tests in the crystal ball uh, that we predicted for that. And now I'm happy to report that we, as was reported widely online, absolutely nailed this one. The test we said was either most or second most likely was used essentially in full for this. In fact, for all of the main sections in use, reading comp games and LR, we predicted not just the source test, which we'll get to, hint it was August 22, but we even listed all four of the exact passage topics and the nature of the toughest game that we saw all week and gave a game that was very similar to it for people to practice in the crystal ball. We'll touch on which one that was. But I mean, the number of messages that I got from people that were like, we're, we're starting Dave to be accused of like, surely you guys have a mole inside LSAC, right? Have you bugged their offices? <laughs> what, what power are your binoculars kind of thing? That uh, deductive power of reasoning is what we have and a huge archive of test usage uh, tracking. Without that, you know, the deductive power really would not be of, of a huge value. Now, for the many people who wrote us and said, you know, thank God I'd looked at that or that really helped, it's fantastic. Some people were like, well, I didn't have any of those. Remember, we're not trying to predict every single test for every single person. That is impossible. It is not something that anyone ever could do uh, or I think even can do. And so if you d had it, it's like, hey, that's an extra bonus for you. Um, if you didn't, that's what happens. I mean, I've said this many times, no one should even be able to ever predict anything on the LSAT from a content standpoint. So the fact that we're able to do this so consistently, um, is, is already out of sorts. So when someone comes to me and says, oh, you know, you didn't predict my test. I'm like, that's okay. The system and what we're attempting to do actually has that built in as an expectation. So just keep in mind how it is we're trying to use it. What we're trying to do is say, if, if lightning does strike and we get it right again, that will benefit some people. And I can guarantee you that in reading comprehension and logic games, some people were definitely benefited by this. And that's what good test preparation is, helping people get better. You don't know if you're going to get the same test as the person next to you. If they've studied something that is specific to that type of test, they have an advantage. That's luck of the draw, unfortunately. So we just look at it as doing our jobs and some people get benefited more than others. We can't control that, but we're going to try to benefit as many people as we possibly can. John, on that note, you want to run it down? Yeah, let's do that. So uh, again, a good take. Let's start with logic games. And again, just quickly to remind you, this is going to include the domestic games, games that were used both domestically and internationally, and games that were used solely overseas internationally. I'll start with the domestic and then work our way down um, but be patient with this, because there are four different scored sections of Logic Games that I'm about to work through. The first that we saw were the ones that we predicted. We saw these right out of the gate Thursday morning, and this was the most prominent or predominant set of games that were used all through this testing administration. 23 questions. They come from the August 2022 LSAT. Again, a test we predicted. These were the four games. The first one, interestingly enough, it used to be about a nonprofit charity and the order in which I, things were happening there. 
I heard this time they may have swapped it out for a game about boilers being repaired in some sequence or order. They do this sometimes. Every once in a while, they'll swap a piece for a piece. Um, regardless of the topic, that first game was just basic sequencing. Nobody struggled much with it. Here are the more interesting three games in that section. The second game was about reserved and unreserved seats at five different sporting events, football, hockey, judo. The third game was about rocks or gems, three rocks or gems, feldspar, jasper, quartz in six different cases. And then the game that immediately freaked people out, like by the time I woke up Thursday morning, I was hearing about this game. Four posters in four different train stations being rotated through September, October, and November. This was a very tricky game, but this is the game, as Dave and I have both alluded to, that we gave a very specific game in the problem sets that we recommended in the Crystal Ball for pattern games that was extremely similar to this. It's a game from June 2014. The fourth game there is about trading work pieces over four days of a week. That game and this game were remarkably similar. And I heard from so many people, I mean, essentially like boiling over with gratitude. Thank God I did that work pieces game because I knew exactly what to do with the posters and the train stations. It was actually the first message I got on Thursday. It was yeah. I just finished. I'm so happy I did the logic game about the work pieces. And of course, we can talk about, I think, a little bit like, hey, that game has similarities because they're not going to use it again. You know, games is gone in June anyway. They're not going to use it in both April and June. So I don't think there's any kind of like state secret being let out here about that. But we highlighted it in the webinar and I've talked about this before is like sometimes we see the most difficult game and we can find something that is similar. We knew this game was out there. Um, and so some people had... You know, that's not an easy game. If you come into it and it's just out of the blue, it can really set you back. So we're not saying that, oh, that's an easy game or anything like that. No way. The last game is challenging on this test. But it sure is a lot easier if you have studied the canon of logic games out there and you've encountered one that's similar. Because I've said this before about the LSAT and very specifically about games. The past is prologue. What they have done in the past keeps coming back up, whether it's rules, relationships, setups, these types of things. And so there's many instances of that. This just happens to be a really good kind of parallel between the two. And some people who had done that and studied it and really learned it by heart were able to do that game a little bit more easily than perhaps some other people who hadn't prepared in that way. So kind of cool. Yeah, very cool. If you're one of the people who paid attention to the crystal ball and actually went out and did that, or if you've just been really thorough in your studies and have encountered that game anyway. Um, if you hadn't, though, I can tell you that that fourth game in this section about the posters, it was a beast. I mean, just yeah. really, really unusual if you'd never seen anything like it. Yeah. And people ask me all the time, oh, does the crystal ball really help? Does it really work? I'm like, you don't see the messages that we get with reading comp and the topics. It's not, helps some people more than others. Some people just makes them feel more comfortable and that's all you really need. With games, it can at times really make a difference. And I think it did so on this particular test. All right. So that was the first, I think the most that was the first section I saw in use, as did you. We saw it a lot through the weekend. A lot of people ended up having to face that section. What else did they throw at us? Yeah, so there's another real section of games that was used only domestically, as far as I can tell. Uh, this is a, one of those multiple use sections. This is not the second or even third time, I think, that we've seen this. These are from October 2022. And these four games, 23 questions. The first game was on ordering of six variables. Seems to be some uncertainty on the topic. The second game was appointments for six people over Monday through Wednesday. The third game, a quartet uh, with violins, cello, piano. And then the fourth game was the toughest by far. Students in an art show, having their arts in different galleries, three different galleries from September, October, and November. Which is interesting, that's the same three months in the last game about the train station and the posters. Uh-huh. So, and again, two sections in a row where the fourth game was kind of a killer, but leading up to it, it wasn't as bad. Although I do think this was on the whole a harder section than the posters section. Yeah, just because the posters doesn't start super tough. Yeah, you had three pretty benign games leading into posters. In fact, I had a lot of people saying, like, I wasn't sure what to do with the posters game, but I had 15 minutes to do it. So I just powered through. This second section that I just mentioned about, you know, the quartet with violins and cello and the students in the art show galleries, there were several games there that could be a real time drain and difficult. That quartet game, for instance, game three was really tough. Yeah, time sinks. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, All right. two sections so far of real games, ones we have seen before, but we didn't get pure reuse. There was a new section 
that they put into play. And this was used, interestingly enough, both domestically here in the States and Canada, as well as internationally. So I saw people in well, really all over get this set of four games, 23 questions. These are real, but these were new. The first game was about seven witnesses being interrogated or interviewed by lawyers. The second was about a jazz trio, six people, three in, three out for a jazz trio, as you'd expect, three. The third game was three cruise ships with five different amenities, things like nightclub and karaoke bar and stuff. Uh-huh. And then the fourth game was about three different instructors teaching five photography classes on different styles of photography, portrait, underwater, wildlife. Tricky game there as well to end. But those were all new. So again, nothing we could have predicted there. Aside from a lot of the games that we talked about telling people to do in the recommended sets were similar to this. In and out games, for instance, we really harped on that idea with conditionality. That three cruise ships with five amenities sounds to me like a grouping game with five into three, one of the most classic distributions. You talk about that in the crystal bowl. Uh So again, a lot of people were like, I'd not seen these topics before, but I knew what to do because I worked through what you guys talked about. Yeah, well, I specifically selected multiple games with five into three structures, knowing that they've been harping on that quite a bit. And at least as far as new content, meaning that it hadn't been administered before as a scored section that we see, we don't try to predict that. We know that these formations are floating around so we can go out and find analogs to those. Uh, And that is, I think, most helpful in logic games as opposed to uh, the other two sections. So we're able to kind of say, even though it's new and they haven't used it as a scored section before, hey, we do have games that look similar to this that will help you feel more comfortable with it. That's the whole point. It's a comfort thing. Uh, with what we're doing with the crystal ball. And those of you who haven't attended one of those, probably right now you're thinking to yourself, this does actually sound like it could have helped. It does. That's the whole point. We're not doing it for fun. I'd say it always helps because what we talk about broadly is always going to be applicable. Tendencies and trends of the test makers, for instance, I mentioned in logical reasoning, really prioritize pointed issue questions. They're testing those more than ever. We talked about in reading comp, the nature of how the passages are being put together and the style of reading that you need these days. You obviously gave a lot of suggestions that would have applied to lots of sections. So even if we don't get the test prediction right or the RC topics right, which in this case we actually did, but even if we don't, the rest of that discussion is still hugely beneficial because it's so broadly and specifically applicable to whatever you're going to face. Yeah. The LSAT is, as we know, a standardized test, meaning they adhere to certain standards in terms of its making. They have to be consistent. If you're consistent, you become predictable. It's just not something that people have tried before. We tried it. And instead of, you know, falling flat on our face, it's actually working all right. So I'm happy about it. Yeah. There you go. It's a high wire act, but we're still up there. There was one other set of real games that we saw But I only saw these for international people. So again, if you've been waiting patiently for your games overseas, let's see if this hits the mark. 23 questions. And this has been a set of games that's been reused a few different times as well. Interestingly, also on that August 22 test, the first game, student presentations like school project assignments. The second set or second game in the set was people traveling to various towns. The third one, pretty recognizable and time-consuming, was about senior and junior employees in different categories like leadership, management, production. And then the fourth game, an interesting one that has inspired past drink choices, was about three breweries serving three types of beer, lager, porter, and stout, over nine weeks. So a lot of spaces to fill there. That was a hard game. I wonder if I'll ever see that game. I wonder if they're ever going to bother releasing anything else with games on it. Part of me hopes they just do a complete, like vault dump but I that would not be awesome they won't do that but i might have to ask about that hey can i see that game <laughs> see if they'll they'll let it go john those are four real sections and i'll make one note which is that you've mentioned like their primary uses domestic domestic international international it doesn't mean there wasn't crossed over we could have that first section could have been seen by an international test taker the last section which was more so where international test test takers could have been used by a domestic one. These are just the primary usages that are there. The one thing I do see, John, is that that's four real sections. Did we have any experimentals? I mean, no one should be shocked at this point that the answer to that is no, we did not. There is zero reason for them to test experimental games at this point. And we haven't seen experimental games since like the middle of last year, frankly. So Yeah. yeah, no surprise, no experimentals, domestic or overseas. 
Yeah, which is an advantage if you're a test taker these days, because when you run into Logic games, you can pretty much bet that it's going to be real. It would be the rare exception who had two Logic games, and we're not hearing from those exception people, uh, if they even exist. As John said, there's no reason to test Logic games. So when you're taking the LSAT in June, or if you're taking the makeup exam here, typically what you're going to see is when you hit that Logic game section, it's going to be the scored section. You know that the 100% effort's required, and... Hopefully things go well. Yeah, hopefully so. Let's get into reading comp. And if you thought that games discussion just now was a bit of a slog, uh, buckle up. Because there were five different scored sections of reading comp between domestic and international testing and an experimental. So we're about to run through six different sets of passages. Sweet. Have at it. <laughs> one, one sip second. And then I'll do LR for you. Right, that's fine. Powered by scotch. I got this all day. Let's do reading comp. So the first section that we saw again was a set that we predicted, and I mean quite literally, to the letter. All four of these topics that you're about to hear were ones that I mentioned very specifically in the last crystal ball before April and told people to go out and do their research on these. The people who did, I mean, again, unanimously responded with gratitude and I think astonishment. 27 questions. These come from August 2022. These were the four passages. Uh, it was a passage about a Mexican photographer, Graciela Irbide, I think, uh, and a photo, Mujer Angel. I'm butchering this. No, it wasn't bad on that last one. Thanks. Thank you. I'm, I'd like to say I've been practicing. I've not. <laughs> but it was about her um, relationship with a mentor and how she kind of broke away from this guy, Bravo, who had been her mentor. It was a passage in that section about water use, privatization of water and utilities and management, the government's responsibility there. Sounded like a legal passage. Uh, uncivil obedience and civil disobedience, which was a, a tough one for a lot of people. And then uh -huh. Galileo making a mistake, ultimately, uh, a physics mistake in trying to determine how Dante's Inferno would have been laid out with the layers of hell um, and whether it could scale to a size appropriate to accommodate sinners. Boy, that seems like a ridiculous type of conversation they would have been having several hundred years ago, too. That's a very 17th century conversation. You're right. <laughs> the comparative in that, by the way, was the water use and management. And I know for some people that was a tough one. But, you know, a section again that we had predicted, the fact that you could have gone out and actually read about that Galileo and Dante relationship or looked up Graciela and Irbide and known about her work and her photography style and her background, which was entirely possible because I said to do it. That for a lot of people was sort of twofold beneficial. No, one, it's just nice to be familiar with topics when you can be. Two, it told people as soon as they saw that, that, that section was real. And so for people who got two RCs, particularly on Thursday, as soon as they read those passages, they were like, I know this counts. They told me this would count if I saw it. And they did. Yeah. And let me make a, a follow-up comment to you know the discussion that you had within the crystal ball on this. You know, sometimes it's like, well, does it help to actually look up the topics? Just keep in mind that we're not saying that you should do two days of research on this. You know, 15, 20 minutes is actually enough to make you feel pretty comfortable. And we're actually fairly specific about what to look for. We don't just say, go study space. Copyright. Like that would be <laughs> useless. All right. Instead, we're going to start saying maybe it's this author and this idea so that you can really hone it in and it doesn't take a long time. If this was something where it's going to take you three to four hours to look up each topic, we wouldn't recommend it. That wouldn't be a good use of your time. But you could go here and look up the Galileo mistake with Dante Inferno, and there's literally a couple paragraphs on it that gives you some context. How does that work when you then go take the test? When you run into it, if you have done that, it feels more comfortable. And comfort on this test is uh, an absolute massive advantage because mostly what they're doing is trying to keep you off balance. So if you can say to yourself, hey, I've got a little bit of a head start. I can start absorbing the information more quickly. It gives you a big boost. And that's the whole point. If it was like, oh, it's, it's just general water rights, that's not going to help. It's too broad. We try to stay away from the broadness and the RC recommendations and it's just something to think about in terms of what we're doing. Yeah. And fortunately, this is not the first time I, people are like, wow, how did you guys do it? I'm like, we do this a lot more often than people realize. We've done this with like Ansel Adams and an aperture style that he helped to popularize. I did it with Lawrence Krauss and his book, A Universe from Nothing. And that came up on the very next test as we told people to look for it. So the specificity here is has not only proven to be helpful, it's proven to be remarkably accurate. It's part of what makes it worthwhile. Yeah. So, all right, let's go to that next section. Yep. 
Uh, the next one was another reuse, but again, the fourth probably reuse of these passages, so not ones we were attempting to predict. These real 27 questions, these four. Uh, tipping servers, hominids and savanna theory about hominids' upright posture and the evolution of it, an Argentinian novelist and the literature and irony of Roberto Arlt, and then a bill restricting women and children's workday and employment hours in early 1900s, 20th century Britain. That was the comparative passage. Let me put a, an asterisk on this, though. I only heard about this set from maybe two different people. So this was clearly the least popular or the least administered of all the ones we're going to talk about. Um, I don't imagine a whole lot of people listening to this had this section, but some people did, so we include it. Yeah, and let's talk a little bit about that since it's of some value. We're talking about sections that we were able to identify through talking to people, what have you, instructor reports and so forth. Is it possible that there are sections in here that um, we don't cover that you had? Yes, it is possible. Um, we have to hear from you in order to be able to like confirm that it was actually used, but it probably means that it wasn't administered to a large group of people. Some of these tests or some of these sections really weren't administered to very large numbers of individuals. So we, we, we can kind of see from the reporting, uh, some sections, it's like, you keep hearing about them over and over and over again. You know, I'll be on my 30th report of the same section. Uh, that deals with, um, you know, Frederick Douglass or something like that. And I'll be like, all right, say it's that, it's that particular passage, that set that's going on here, but there can be exceptions. And it may be that it was a small group of test takers and we didn't hear about it in those instances. It's not going to be here. If you don't hear your section, whether it's logic games, reading comp or logical reasoning, send us a message. We will add it to the file afterwards so that we know that it was there. And that helps us for future predictions that we make. Yeah. You skipped through a lot of the disclaimer points that you usually cover. I believe this is point number three, which is if we don't hear from you, it's kind of on you if your section sure. doesn't get covered. I, we're only as good as the information we get. So again, help us help you going forward if you can. We Let's can only, conf we can only yeah. confirm based upon the information that we get is probably the, the more accurate way of saying it. But That's a better that way aside, say it, right? let's go on. Sure. Uh, and now we actually get into, if there's a Venn diagram of domestic and international, we're in that overlap piece, which is a section that was new. We had not seen these passages scored before. 27 questions, and again, this was used um, globally. These were the four passages in this section. 16th century Italian women uh, and in the development of improvisation or improv, there's something about mimes and della arte, something. Uh, I think that was in the, yeah, 1500s. It was a passage about preventing steps leading up to a crime or preemptive criminal punishment. A lot of people said that was tough. A passage about, science passage about judging adaptive traits and evolution. I think it used giraffes as an example. And then uh, what I think would have been an interesting passage, the comparative passage, was about Frederick Douglass and whether he was a libertarian and the authors of Passage A and Passage B took slightly different views on that. So there you go. That was a new section, but we saw it used both stateside and abroad. Uh, so if you saw that, whether you're here or there, know that a lot of people saw that one. And now we get into what I believe is exclusively international and only a few people saw this, but again, it's worth mentioning 27 questions. These were real, and this has been reused a lot all the way back from October, 2020 and many times since these four passages, uh, Chinua Chibe's novel, things fall apart and how it helped to reframe like the Igbo language and tradition, uh, in European form. EMF uh, litigation, electromagnetic field litigation, who's responsible for property value loss, homeowners of the electric companies, the publicization or publicization versus privatization of public health works like highways. That was the comparative passage and probably the hardest. And then finally, a passage on fungi spores on trees, acting as endophytes and protecting trees from damage. That, by the way, was a passage in the past, Dave, that I had recommended people go study up on in anticipation of it being used prior to August 2021, where it was used. So, go us. Excellent. And I think there was one more that was out there as well that was real. Oh, that's right. There's so yeah, many. There's, there's, you're right. There's one more. <laughs> there's so many, it's easy to one miss One more them. international passage. I think I went right past it. The good news is we're still in exclusively international territory here. So... There's one more real international section. Thanks, Dave, keeping me straight. Again, we've seen this used multiple times, January 2020, August 22. Here were these four passages. International cybersecurity, regulating illegal activities, uh, Native American mobilian jargon, pigeon language exchange, the science of aging, which I think would have been interesting, um, lifespan and genes, 
senescence. Um, telomeres, probably. And then a passage I would love to read, a comparative passage, and probably the hardest in this set, was about art forgeries, replicas and their aesthetic value. Uh, it mentioned Vermeer, for instance, and I think Van Meegeren, the forger. So that would have been quite interesting. I think Vermeer's daughter was a part of that as well. You know, when I was in New York, um, got two months ago, saw a couple of Vermeers, and I immediately thought of this passage. Not that I've read it, but it made me... Uh, connect the LSAT world, in this case, to the art world. So that is really your five sections that we know were all scored and were real. There was one other section that uh, they seem to use a lot as, as the RC experimental. John, might as well run that one down and close this one out. I will, but something you said on Vermeer has me stuck. And so I'm going to say this for you, maybe only, Dave, as I know you'll at least appreciate it, is there's this kind of subversive theory in the art world that Vermeer was a bit of a fraud using a device called a camera obscura, <laughs> which is essentially like a lens projector thing, um, because he was best friends with the greatest lens maker of the time, this guy named uh, Anton van Leeuwenhoek. And they couldn't find a camera obscura in Vermeer's effects at his death, but guess who the executor of his estate was? Is van Leeuwenhoek the person who would have made him one in the first place? So Yeah, you know, this is what I have to say about that. All right, so you cast the picture up there and then you painted it. You're still a good painter, man. I couldn't do it. No, I no, about I, it. I'm hopeless. <laughs> I'm hopeless. But it that his, make his you legacy has been somewhat tarnished in the fact that he didn't freehand it like Da Vinci or something. They don't know that for sure, but they whatever. don't. They don't. Um, I did read an interesting book. Let's get back to reading comp. <laughs> uh, and the one experimental section that we saw, I only saw this experimental section domestically. It's possible some people people overseas had double reading comps. I just didn't hear from them. But if you saw these passages on your test, they did not count. 27 questions about Cuban internet access, civil versus common law systems impact on investors and shareholders, the domestication of crops, watermelon, uh, I believe in maybe Africa, and then rice and millet seed, I think in China. That was the comparative passage. And then uh, the cultural influence of metaphors, like the phrase carpe diem, which apparently originally meant not seize the day, but pluck the day. And how our usage and the culture has changed the uh, the meaning of certain metaphors. You know, carpe diem really sticks in my craw because when I was a senior in high school, um, I in the English class that was one of the questions on a test that I took was like, what was the phrase used by like what the cap is the Cavaliers? I can't remember. And I wrote carpe diem or seize the day. And my English teacher gave me zero credit saying that I didn't know the answer. That's why I'd written it out both ways. And I was like, that's, they mean the same, whatever. <laughs> so I'm always been pissed whenever I see carpe diem, because I remember that. And I remember my uh, high school English teacher's name who did that to me. Yeah. You, you didn't just answer it right. You answered it twice correctly. I crushed it and got zero credit and was told that I didn't know the answer. That's why I wrote it that way. I was like, Bro, come on, I'm just writing out the exact appropriate answer. It was too correct, Dave. Game on yeah. Him. I won't sully his name by mentioning it here. He's he's now retired from uh, Minnetonka High School, but I don't appreciate yeah, well, it. I'll speak for both of us and say good riddance. <laughs> he was actually a great teacher, but God, that was a sucky moment. He's the only teacher that ever gave me detention, too, and that was also irritating. Oh, yeah. We'd be here all day if I had to list those. So... <laughs> <laughs> I think he's right. the only one. I don't remember. So that takes us through reading comp. Again, five scored sections, some exclusive to domestic, some exclusive international. And then that new one about Frederick Douglass that seems to have appeared in both places. But there you go. So a lot of reading comps swirling around. Makes sense that they're trying to get a lot of this out there too and still using experimental sections of reading comp, which will persist long beyond games, presumably. Let's talk, and by let's, I mean you talk about logical reasoning. Okay, I'll do it. You really did the uh, the lion's share of the work, the yeoman's work going through that, so appreciate it. I think LR is a little bit easier to do. Uh, let's start off with the section that we saw coming out of the gates on Thursday. This was part of the test that we'd predicted the August 2022 being the primary prediction there. If you had this section and you had these questions, they were real. This was a scored section for you. And I'll make a few comments about topics as we kind of roll through here. So ancient charcoal writing in caves, 
Earth's ozone and carbon emissions, basically CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, as it were. Bullfrogs in a pond jumping and leaping. Businesses applying for a government waiver uh, and permits for storefront uh, lights. Caffeine content in coffee grounds versus tea. Salmon and insecticide use. Electric versus petroleum, gas, automobiles, runners and stretching before races, and does time travel exist? Also, a question in there about uh, insulin with in oats and bread and health and myopia. Lots of questions in these various sections about vision. So sometimes people said, oh, it's about eyesight. It's like, wait a second, there's another question about eyeballs. There was another question about blurred vision. We've talked about this. It's in the disclaimers that I didn't read, how sometimes they use similar topics through different sections to cause confusion. So uh, I'm not going to emphasize the ones on vision as much, but if you're like, wait, didn't I have a question in there about myopia? Yes, that was in there and it was scored. That was 26 questions. It was real. Here's another scored section. 25 questions in this one. Companies in a country avoiding or exploiting tax loopholes. Uh, antioxidants and blurred vision, dolphins protecting swimmers from sharks, historic paintings and tourism in Egyptian tombs with uh, Nefertiti, as well as uh, one about a science fiction book, experiments about yawning in the mirror. You know, there's that whole thing where if you see other people yawn, it makes you more likely to yawn. And then an octopus squirting water at aquarium lights and whether or not the water is what caused the lights to short out and so forth. Uh, and of course, octopi super intelligent that's exactly the kind of behavior i would expect from them it's based on a real event actually yeah mm -hmm. they shouldn't actually keep them in captivity they're too smart for that um so i'm not too happy about that another question about george orwell and then one about the uh hearing one side of a conversation it being distracting and of course everybody hates listening to their partner or friends talk on their phone when you can't hear what else is going on uh, so it's that kind of thing, how distracting it actually is. So that was another real section. Uh, and those two sections, I think we saw a lot of those domestically. Uh, the last section I'll cover here, so I only have to do three, I really got it easy, uh, was one we saw more on the international side, uh, but also floating around uh, all the way back to like January 2020. This uh, section had questions on reptiles and birds in a zoo exhibit, male and female dragonflies in their preferred habitat, unrealistic portrayals of Romeo and Juliet in theater, uh, water waste treatment, a Mesopotamian recipe book. I'm not interested in cooking out of that. Synthetic blood supply and bare feet versus shoes for a runner. All right. That's different than the one about runners stretching, so don't get those two confused. And then oil wells and pipelines and carbon dioxide pollution. And then finally, a question on entrees and side dishes. As is always been the case now for the last year or two, we do not disclose or cover the experimental sections in logical reasoning because we've discovered that when we do that, it actually muddies the water. People start getting confused about what did I have it here, here. This is why we always say when you're done with your LSAT, write down some questions from each of the sections you had so that you can come back to this later on and confirm what was real and what was not. Because if you wrote down, say, five, six questions, you should be able to identify uh, which were the logical reasoning sections you had and immediately know, all right, this is how I felt. Write down topics that you had in each section and write down your feelings about each section. Hated this. This was terrible. I crushed it. Easiest section I've ever taken. That way you can figure out, hey, did I crush the real sections or did the real section hurt me or did I crush it experimental and that's not going to count so I can't, you know, factor that in here. But that runs down all the scored content there. John, anything to add about LR? One point that maybe I'll just emphasize, it's not so much an addition, but a double down, which is again how confusing this gets if you don't immediately write down what you had because the test makers are so actively trying to confuse people both of the real scored sections that we saw domestically had questions about vision the experimental section that we saw primarily in use domestically also had a question about vision in one real section it was about insulin and health and myopia in one real section it was about antioxidants and blurred vision in the experimental section, it was about children outside and how their eyeballs don't develop properly or become elongated, and that leads to some sort of blurriness or myopia. So you can see that this is just extremely easy to get confused by, 
if you're either vague on the topics and where they appear, or if you're going very generic on the topics, eyesight. That could be not good three enough. different sections. It's not good enough. Be specific for yourself. That'll make things a lot easier. And of course, some people might be like, those LSAC people are super tricky. Well, yes, they are. All right. So we'll just establish that as being true. But also these questions a lot of times are generated by people who have expertise in various fairly, I'm not going to say entirely narrow, but it's fairly narrow areas. So if you're writing questions and you know a lot about vision, you'll probably write different versions of them. So all of a sudden those questions all go in and they get chopped together into these various sections. You can have similar topics. We've seen things, for example, on like caffeine and coffee come up on tests where it's just like, there's just a bunch of questions about that. It's just the luck of the draw, the way that it works, but it can be super confusing. And we say to do this on reading comp as well as logic games, because part of what happens as John pointed out earlier, sometimes they switch things out. Maybe we've seen a section three times before. And the fourth time we see it, three of the games are the same, but one of them has been changed or one of the reading comp passages has been changed. This does happen. That makes our job harder, but we track that so that we can see what's going on. Yeah. So there you go. I, just the degree of overlap in broad strokes is uh, kind of remarkable. One of the most confusing things that happened to me for at least a half a day or so is I had a couple of people report that they had a logic game about shipwrecks. Now, the one they were referring to was actually about cruise ships and the amenities, but there was an experimental logical reasoning question about shipwrecks. And just the fact that boats apparently were involved in both was enough for that confusion to creep in. So you can again see how precise and almost immediate you need to be in terms of your recall of this stuff. Yeah, we were fortunate there because I think immediately we were suspicious because the other game that was kind of notable in that section about the cruises it was being described. And I'm like, this is kind of matching up and that you were able to suss out the fact that it's like, no, no, that's, there's not a game there. That's confusion. Uh, and it is in fact cruises, which we'd been hearing a lot about. So we were pretty comfortable with that. Anyway, all that aside, it is time to go through what is maybe the biggest matrix of scoring that, uh, I've ever had to run through. It's a lot. So let us dive into the scale predictions. And as is always the case in a test recap, we get down and what we do is we assess the relative difficulty of these sections. In the disclaimers that I didn't read, I always say the same thing. Hey, we consider every LSAT section hard. So what we're talking about is relative difficulty. Is it super hard, hard, or just not super hard? And so as we kind of go through this, what I will do is I will read each section and then we'll give an estimate of how it would move the scale. How are we looking at the scale? We're focusing on the score of 170 and how many questions you can miss to get a 170. Easiest for us to predict difficulty and movement at the highest levels. Uh, much harder to do it at the 150s and 160s because we can't see the nuance in the questions, but we can feel and see and understand the difficulty at the highest level. So when we look at this, everybody starts at the same uh, point. We assume that you can miss seven questions to get a 170 before we have any kind of you know, adjustment for the, the section difficulty. So what you should do as you go through this is listen for your scored section in logic games, make an adjustment if needed, then do the same thing in reading comp and make an adjustment to that first logic games adjustment. And then finally do it with logical reasoning. And that should bring you to an outcome uh, somewhere in that seven, eight, maybe nine range or halves, depending upon the case. All right. So number of questions you can miss seven. Let's take a look at logic games and see how each one of them was adjusted. The very first section, this is the one from August, 2022 about uh, the reserve seats at a sporting event, the jewels, gems and cases. And then of course the infamous train station posters. We've talked about this before, John, and we said that at the top line, it doesn't move the scale, which I know a bunch of people just got like, they just whatever through their earbuds. Um, but let us explain. This is the nuance that I was talking about where I don't want someone to be like, nah, it doesn't move the scale. We know it's hard, but the first three games for 170 scoring type of students are offset, are much of an offset to that fourth game where it should be a wash and it shouldn't move the scale. However, the way we typically talk about this particular section is we say that as you go down the scale and get into the 160s, then it starts to move the scale more. So we call this essentially a 0.5. Won't move it at 170, but we'll, we'll surely move it at 160. 
Yeah, I'm feel comfortable with that. One, 165 or so. Yeah, and I, I yeah. just want to make one additional point. If you go through the first three games, they're like a 170 plus type of score would, which is to say banking time and basically on cruise control. Then even a game at the end that you're not familiar with, you should have enough time to get through it. Does it cost you a question or two? Maybe, but on the whole, this section's not punishing enough or penalizing enough that I think a 170 is going to be a whole question. Um uh, essentially accommodating for it yeah, especially when there's a historical analog that you could have done beforehand if you'd done the recommended problem sets that last game you get to it you're like all right this is going to be tough because it's it's you know obviously difficult but it's not like i don't know where to start or what to do so 0.5 is what we'd call that but if you're look if you're trying to score 175 that's not loosening your scale off seven Let's go to the next section. This was the October 22 one. That is the Monday to Wednesday appointments, the music quartet, you know, with the cellos and so forth and the art show galleries. We think this test, this section was consistently difficult that it would move your scaling from seven to eight. It'll loosen it up. It was hard enough to make that difference, which doesn't always happen uh, with logic games. So more consistent high level difficulty throughout. So if you had this one, you went from seven to eight now. Let's go to the one that we saw used both domestically and internationally about witness interviews, the jazz trio, the cruise ships that we've talked about a few times here, and then the photography lessons. I think this was in the middle of the difficulty and that it will not move the scale. So you would stay at seven. And then last, the one that was what we saw primarily international about school project presentations, people traveling to town, senior and junior employees, and the game that I really want to do, the breweries and beer game. We've talked about this one before in the past, and uh, what we've said is it's just like the train station posters. It's a 0.5, that it's not moving it at the very top, but once you start dropping down into the 160s, it does give you extra uh, movement and loosens the scale up. So, you know, essentially, you're either at 7, 7.5, or 8, depending upon where you are with the questions. And the 0.5, you have to assess your own scoring. If you're like, I'm a 170s person, you're like, that's really zero for me. If I'm scoring the 160s or lower, that's actually moving it to 8. Let's go to reading comprehension. Starting off with that August 22 section, this was the Mexican photographers, water use, uncivil disobedience, and Galileo and Dante. This is a tough section, as so many of these RC sections are. This is going to move the scale one. So if you were at seven, you just moved to eight. If you were at eight, you just moved uh, one more to nine. Next section, tipping servers, hominids on a savanna, uh, the Argentinian fiction with Roberto Arlt, and women's work hours, also difficult. We've talked about this one in the past. It would move the scale by one as well if that was your scored section. Then let's go to the next section that was kind of used on both sides, domestic and international. Italian improv, preemptive punishment, adaptive traits, and Frederick Douglass. We don't think this one's going to move the scale. So if you had that one, um, we think that, that you would stay where you're at, no movement, plus or minus. All right, on to stuff that we saw more on the international side. International cybersecurity, mobilian jargon, science of aging, and art forgery. Uh, that's another tough one that will move the scale by one. And what we've seen in recent years is that RC has been, the, you know, the brutalizing section on a more consistent basis. Most of these are moving it by one, as is the last one about Chinua Achebe, EMFs, privatization, and fungi spores. That would also move it. So every one of these RC is going to move the top line 170 difficulty and loosen it by one, except for the one that involved Frederick Douglass. All right. And then last, LR, which will be easier than uh, you would have thought. A lot of these LR sections seem to be right in the middle. That's how we feel about all three of these. So let's go for the first one. Electric cars, frogs leaping, the bullfrogs, cave riding, CFCs, caffeine and tea, the runners stretching. Uh, we think that's not going to move the scale. It's a hard section, but it's not hard enough to move it at the 170 level, which is a very, very high standard. Next section, uh, dolphins and sharks, science fiction, yawning, the octopus that shouldn't be trapped, but is shooting uh, water at the lights. Orwell, chimps versus dog, and Italian tombs and Nefertiti also not moving the scale and finally the same thing with the last one which was reptile birds and zoos dragonflies romeo and juliet wastewater a mesopotamian recipe book that we don't ever want to cook from and synthetic blood also a zero there and so 
you can see that it looks like there's a ton of different options, but remember a lot of these sections were paired with other sections. And so that reduces the number of possible outcomes. A lot of the international sections were together, a bunch of the domestic sections were together. So it's not as if you're just looking at this and there's 60 different possibilities. There's fewer than that ultimately in this, even though mathematically there are that many possibilities. And that's the run. And here's the thing, no matter what happens here, scores, assuming you've done all the right things and you have an LSAT writing on file, will come out Wednesday, May 1st at 9 a.m. Eastern. If you are doing the retake next week, you had a problem on this administration, first off, I'm sorry that you had a problem because that's never something that is enjoyable. Uh, I heard some definitely unhappy stories, especially with search uh, and kind of like the search not working at all. Had one student who apparently was feeling great about the test and with about 10 minutes left, everything just shut down on them, you know, devastating. Had another student who went through the first two sections and then that's it. Proctor takes forever, doesn't come back and then the whole thing shuts down. Stories like that happen every single time. When you take that retake test, two things, you will get your scores back at the same time as everyone else on May 1st. Also, as I said before, we do not try to predict that test because they have so many different options. Occasionally, they reuse some of the content from the main weekend, but usually they don't. So it's not something that, you can, that can be relied on. And that's the summary. There you go. I've got one comment to make about the makeup tests, and then you and I can get back to our cocktails, mm -hmm. which is this, because I, I get asked this question constantly. Does the crystal ball that's still available for the April and the June tests you can go to our website and register for it. You can go to that free seminars page and register for it there as well. Does that apply to the makeup test next week? And as you said, it doesn't in terms of us trying to predict specific topics or test reuses, but it absolutely does conceptually in terms of points of emphasis and what the test makers are up to and what you should expect with question frequency, question types, again, points of emphasis, the types of flaws that they're testing, the types of logic games you're likely to see. And as always, the recommended problem sets are so valuable, regardless of what you get, that you'd be really well served as a makeup tester to go do those questions before your test next week, regardless of what you happen to get. And same thing with the general LSAT prep tests and the frequency of where they're pulling from. That's yes. also still accurate. Great point. All right, John, that was uh, fast and furious once we got it underway, but there was a lot of content and usually we don't do the international and domestic together. So that was... Um, I'm not going to say exciting, but it was certainly different. I don't know. It felt like a successful experiment. <laughs> it felt like since if they're going to do crossover and I don't see any reason why they won't yeah. going forward, I mean, do they really need a different international test? Uh, I think those days are, are kind of receding um, into the past. Uh, I think we'll probably see this going forward is that it's just commingled entirely. Yeah. So I think that's probably the new world. I think so too. These things always feel a little evil Knievel to me, but in this case, I think we landed it. So yeah, I think so us. too. It wasn't uh, Caesar's Palace, uh, you know, or Snake Canyon going Snake into Canyon. the side of it. That's a classic for those of you who know the evil Knievel backstory. Uh, in any event, that is the roundup. That's the uh, what's real, what's experimental. If you had something that we didn't talk about, please send us a message. Uh, certainly, we know the scale prediction is sometimes controversial, but that's the way we see it. So uh, we're pretty comfortable with that. And remember, we always are on the conservative side. So if we had the choice of saying it loosens it or it doesn't, and we really felt it was on, on the line, we said it didn't loosen it. That way, if you get a surprise on test day, hopefully it'll be a good one, not a bad one. And on that auspicious note, one more test with uh, the June LSAT with Logic Games. If you're taking that test, join us on uh, May 1st, the night of score release uh, for the Crystal Mini Ball, where we'll talk specifically about that June test, although we won't talk about the percentages of questions and things like that. Uh, it's a pared down version. So if you're taking June and you didn't actually use the Crystal Ball for April and June, go use it because as John has described, it is still helpful. And then we'll update some of the very specific predictions on May 1st in the mini ball. Yeah. And if you're not taking June, but you do get your scores back on May 1st and want to come join us that night, just to brag, we'd love <laughs> to have you. By all means, come flex for the room or better yet, uh, <laughs> give give your fellow test takers. Oh, no, man. All right. Don't I'm going to say something nice. time. I'm going to say something nice. Come be a, a shining light, a beacon of encouragement to come a room have full a glass of people of champagne who are still grinding. And leave the LSAT world. That's that's the joy of this, is that when people do really well, they're gone. 
you know, that's, that's probably the, the great moment where we're like, fantastic, you've succeeded, you can move on from this kind of like strange bubble that we're all stuck in right now. I guess I'm more of a bask in the afterglow, but fair enough. <laughs> I guess if you never do it, it you probably would yeah, have to sit down and, and really uh, yeah, enjoy that's what I'm, I'm basking in nothing. The rare occasion. <laughs> All right. If you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you may find it in the world. And if you've enjoyed it, please leave us a comment and rating as well. We always appreciate those. If you have any questions, whether it's about the LSAT, the admissions process, what have you, the loss of logic game, send those to LSAT podcast at powerscore.com. On behalf of John and myself, we hope this has been useful. Stay safe out there. We'll talk to you soon.